right, so now for the last session, uh, I'm going to present a bit the new features. Uh, like I was saying, uh, features that have been released six months ago, four months ago, three months ago. Uh, one big feature that is going to be released next month. Uh, and then afterwards, so that's the new feature, the left side. Uh, a few things we're going to go through it. And then some ticks and tricks. That's basically some features we have for a long time, but that seems to be quite unknown. Uh, to users, so I'm just going to highlight them uh, in case you were not aware of them. All right, so let's start small. Uh, DI is three. Uh, we have it for a huge, uh, a very long time, but we have made some uh, improvements to it lately. Uh, the first thing we've been adding is the breadcrumb. So now, if you look here on the top of the DI is three, we have a new breadcrumb. I don't know if you're familiar with them. You have them in data miner as well. Uh, to go from a view to a protocol to an element. Uh, here we have it to go through your uh, structure of your uh, protocol. All right. So now, if I select here my after startup, I see that the breadcrumb says protocol, quick action, quick action two. That's my quick action two. All right. Uh, you see that here we just mentioned quick action. You could say you should give the name would be more useful. Uh, we didn't do that because the name could get very large. And then it would use all the space there. So we said, at least at the first step, we can always change our mind, of course. But we figured it would be better to just mention quick action. You have the ID there. Uh, and if you want the name, you can just hover over it. And then you'll have the top tip here with the after startup name. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's to know a bit where you are currently into your driver. But of course, the breadcrumb, you can also use it to navigate. So here, if I have param, I have that little arrow. I can click on it and I have now all my list of params, which is nicer compared to here in a way, because here if you expand everything, the scroll bar becomes huge and it gets a bit hard if you have a really big protocol to work on. Uh, here then you have only the params. Uh, same example here with protocol quick action. You can see only two quick actions. That's my two quick actions that are here. Okay. Don't hesitate to interrupt uh, whenever you have a question. All right, uh, next improvement we've made still to the DIS3 is pinning item. That's one you might not know if you didn't read the release note or something. Uh, it's not physically by default display on the screen. Uh, but yeah, you can right click on an item into your protocol three and you can click pin. If you do that, it goes to a bar here, an extra bar will be added and you see all the pin items. So now you say, okay, I'm going to work a lot with my parameter 1000. And with my parameter 4001, I'm going to pin that. Then I don't need to search through the whole list again to find them back. Same as for the previous one. We didn't want to put the name. It's definitely true here, because if you pin five items, quickly it can grow very wide. Uh, so it's just quick action ID. And then you can hover over it, and you see the name. Of course, you can unpin. If you can pin, you should be able to unpin. So either you right click on the item that is pinned, my pin now you became unpin because this after startup is already uh, here. Uh, so you can unpin from there or directly from the pin bar. Uh, you can right click on any item, you can unpin or you can unpin all of them in one go. Just, uh, just yeah. out of curiosity, does it remember what protocol you have pinned? That's a session to session. It's not saved in any okay. setting file or anything, so across restart it's, uh, you have to repeat. Okay. Yeah, for now at least. It's a first draft. Uh, but I think it's already quite useful with that. All right. All right. Uh, next thing is the DIS validator. Again, something we've had for a long time. Uh, but in the past, if you remember, we had all those errors that were added to the classic Visual Studio error pane. Uh, but that we were limited by that. We wanted to add some extra fancy features to the validator. Uh, if you use the Visual Studio one, you're limited to only two severities, error and then warning. That's it. And you cannot start adding extra properties or something. It's just a list of errors and that's it. All right. Uh, we wanted to add a lot of properties. We wanted to add a lot of severities. So what we made now, we made a dedicated DIS validator pane. Uh, also for the reason that the Visual Studio error pane was a bit cluttered. All the errors that are by default shown by Visual Studio were merged together with the validator one. So at some point, we were like, OK, the Visual Studio ones, typically, they are the most important one. 
but then they got lost in the middle of all the DIs validator issues that you could have. Uh, so we thought it was a good idea to separate it for that reason as well. All right, so how to access it? As usual, via DIS, two windows, and in there you have DIS validator. A uh, reminder, if you have Visual Studio 2019, Visual Studio decided to move all the menus that concern a uh, extension behind an extension menu. So if you update to Visual Studio, Studio 2019, that DIS will be gone from here. If you have a refactor, if you have a compare, any other extension that you would install, it will also have its menu gone, and it will go under an extension. This one will be re replaced by extensions, and DIS will be under there. All right, we have no control. We cannot put it back up. Uh, we looked into it, but uh, it's a choice from Microsoft. Um, we have no way to get it back up to there. So it's an extra click. All right. Let's see. That's the new pane. What have we, we, have we been adding? Uh, is first of all, different severities, four severities. Now it's uh, consistent with the severities you have in data miners. Uh, we just don't have the low and the high, of course, it doesn't make sense in, uh, in this case. But we have the critical, major, minor, and warning. We use the colors. Those are the colors for data miner, for the little story. Uh, so if you update your colors into data miner, it will get updated here as well. So it takes the color from the data miner you connect to, just so that you keep working with the color you're used to. All right. Uh, if you want to know some information about what is critical, what is major, we don't just guess from the error if it should be critical or not. We have applied some rules to ourselves. Uh, you can just hover over one of the severity, and then you'll get a tooltip with explanation about what it actually means, that severity. Uh, quickly, critical is anything that might impact your whole system, not only your driver. That we don't consider that critical. If it's critical, it means if you launch that driver, you might break your whole system. That's the first thing critical. The other one, it's less critical, but it's still critical to us. Uh, it's all the administration thing. So if you don't have a nice name, if you don't have a nice version, if you don't have an integration ID, we need that to be able to save it into the database of the list of drivers we have. All right, so those we consider also critical. Major, that's something that will make a feature of your driver not work. So whatever you intend to do, it won't work, but it's just that feature. Maybe the rest of the driver will work, still fine. You won't crash the whole system, uh, but it's still major because what you're trying to do is not going to work. Okay. Uh, minor is what we consider having no impact on does it work or does it not work. So everything will work still, but it's not according to the guidelines. Uh, why would we say it's not according to the guidelines, for example, performance reason? If we see something that is going to slow down the system, everything will still work, just slow. All right? So that will be there. Uh, if it's not consistent, we try to have some consistency between every driver, etc. Uh, we're going to show that into a minor error. All right? The warning, no impact at all. Uh, if you mistype a tag, you have a tag there that won't be used by data miners because it's not recognized. So we don't know what you try to do there. Uh, but it's just a useless tag, so you might want either to check if you intended to insert something else there, either get rid of it. Okay. Second thing, uh, an extra column here. So as you can see, we've seen, we added quite some columns uh, into the, the, the Visual Studio one. We only had a description and an error code, that's it. Here we added some extra columns. The first one is certainty. What is certain is just, OK, can we programmatically be 100% sure what you've done there is an error or not? If you're certain, we flag it as certain. Otherwise, uncertain. That means we think it's very likely that you made a mistake there. Uh, we would like you to double check it. All right? Next thing we've been added is the fixed impact. Breaking, non-breaking. What is that? Uh, if you have already an element running on your data miner, using a protocol, and then you make changes to that protocol. Some changes are considered breaking, meaning that if you apply them to your element, you might break some things that you have configured. Example, you have a parameter on which you enable alarming. If we get rid of that parameter, 
well, you still have configured alarm and you expect an alarm, maybe you have correlation based on that alarm, and maybe your whole system is based on that. That's something we consider breaking chain. If we change the idea of a parameter, you don't want to do that. You might have an automation script that pulls that parameter by ID. All right? So we find an error. We say, if you fix it, you will break it. If it's the very first version that you're making, go for it, fix it. Otherwise, it will be too late. If it's the second one, you might need to consider either I don't fix it, so I don't make a breaking change, either I do, but then I have to update the version of the driver add a new range. You know, into the driver, you have four bits. Uh, the last one, if you increment the last one, it means no breaking change normally. Uh, if you really need to make that fix, well, then you need to increment the third one. OK. An extra column is the source. Uh, we have a validator. That's what we've always had. And now we also have a major change checker. That's related a bit to the fixed impact. Uh, what is this one? The validator, we just validate your driver. And we say here is a mistake. The major change checker, we're going to compare the previous version of the driver with the one you're making now. And we're going to identify in there any breaking change. Right? So if you fixed in your new version something that is breaking, well, then afterward, if you compare it with the previous version, the major change checker is going to say, you made a, a breaking change there. All right? So it's a good idea to run that one as well when you finished to know if you need to increment that third uh, digit of the version or not. Does the major change checker look? Um, so if you went from, say, 100 to 100, it's 100, 100, yeah. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, if you have 20 drivers uh, opened, it will be smart enough to find out which one is the latest version starting from the new one. So we start from the new one, we start counting down, and the first match is the one we will use by default. But whenever you run it, uh, if you by default press the validate here, we'll see that in the next slide, it just validates. If you press the arrow here, you have the option to validate, major change check, or both. If you do one of the two last ones, you will first get a pop-up saying, OK, here are what we identify as the best match for the previous check, but you can overwrite it. OK. Next thing we've been doing is adding some extra details. Uh, this here we have since ever a description, but it's a, we cannot write a book in there, right? And sometimes you need a lot more background info, so typically what you would do is go to the development guide and try to find some more information. Well, to avoid you to have to do that, we added some extra details. Uh, whenever some extra details are available, you have that little eye info in icon here that appears. Uh, you just click it, you get a pop-up with those are all the classic ones that I just showed, and then the three last one, how to fix. It tells you how, uh, gives you an idea of how you could fix. Uh, some extra details, a bit of background information around what you should do there, and then a good example. All right. We've also been working on code fixing. So, so far we were just validating and telling you this is wrong. Uh, now we even provide you, when possible, a possibility to fix it automatically. All right. So that's the case whenever that icon here is available. All right. Uh, so if that one is available, it means you can right click on the error, you can go fix, and then you can fix this error. You just fix the one on which you right click, or fix all of them of the same type. So in this case, I have two missing page buttons, I have two empty, I have three unrecommended things. If I right click on this one and say fix all, I will fix the two first one, the two missing width. All right. So basically, this one says missing page button width. So you have a page button, and you didn't define the size of that button. Uh, we always recommend it to use 130 by default. So if you click that one, it will add 130 to all of them. All right? Maybe it's not what you want. The fix here is not always what you want. Maybe you want 150 for some reason or another. Uh, but typically, 130 for consistency through drivers, again, is what we recommend as a width. So the fix will go for the recommended value. OK? All right, next thing we've been doing is some grouping. 
in the past, again, if you have 20 parameters with the same ID, ID5, you will have 20 errors in there. Again, cluttering your error pane. Okay? So now, when it doesn't make sense to have multiple, we make one, but we still have, want to have sub-results. Uh, so in this case, we have only one saying, okay, duplicated param 5, and then we here present the list of parameters. Uh, but remember, whenever you have an error in Visual Studio, uh, in the validator, you can double-click that error to go to the wrong parameter. But here you have five wrong parameters. This is why we still want the sub-errors uh, to be available, so you can just expand. You have them, and then you can double-click on each of them, and you will go to each of those parameters. Okay? All right, here is how, how to access it. Uh, I was saying a bit earlier, if you just do validate, it just validates and shows the error here. Uh, if you do compare or both, you will first get the pop-up. It found out, I might have 20 drivers. It found out first, okay, let's take two of them which have the same name. So my driver here is the name of my driver. And then it sees that I'm trying to compare on this one. It found the one that is just below. All right. But of course, yeah, that's a checkbox you can, uh, the combo box, you can uh, select whatever you want. And then if you check, it returns some errors. So here, two examples of an error for which the source is the major change checker and not the validator. Uh, missing display parameter. So you had a parameter that was displayed something, somewhere. You get rid of it, the customer is going to be like, where is my parameter? So that's something we consider a breaking change, uh, or a major change at least. Another example, main connection type SNMP was changed into virtual. I don't know if you know this, but if you change the type of a, a protocol or if you add one or remove one, you need to recreate your element. You cannot reuse the current element. Okay. All right, that's it for the validator. I don't know if there is any question about the validator or if it's all crystal clear. Good. All right. Uh, next thing is repeater tool that was released a while ago, uh, but still within the year. Uh, what you can do here, the point is just to repeat some text that you have into, to your driver with some more uh, intelligence. Of course, we won't, won't just copy paste 20 times that you can do as well, uh, but we will update some, some uh, values in there. Uh, this is an example of a matrix. I don't know if you've worked with a matrix before, but typically when you have a matrix, you need to define a discrete for every input. So you say input one, value one, input two, value two, and you do that potentially thousands of times. Uh, and then the same for the output, but then you have to start the value with the last input plus one, and then output one. And my output two will be six, potentially thousands of times. You don't want to do that manually, very boring, very long. So you can, it's a good example of when you can use that feature. So you select some piece of text, you right click, and you select repeat selected text. Yes. Uh, as you can see, there is shortcut here. That's on my system. I configured those shortcuts. Uh, that will be on one of the last slides. For every feature that DIS has, you are able to define a shortcut. That's something no one knows as well, uh, typically. But via the Visual Studio, there is a command for every DIS command, and you can assign a shortcut to it. Okay. So repeat selected text, in my case, I'm used to do control three. And then you get to that pop-up window. Here, you have what you selected. Uh, you're free to not select anything and type uh, anything you want yourself in there. Uh, but in this case, to make it easy, I, I typed it via DIS because then I have IntelliSense and validation to make sure what I repeat is a good base. And then I get to that pop-up. I have my discrete, and then I mention via these parameters here how many times I want to repeat my text. So here I want to start at one, and I want to repeat it four times. Okay? What it means here, instead of output one, I have replaced that one here with some placeholder, x. x is going to be the value of the start, and, and then keep counting until we have four. So here, my first is output one. My second is output two, and I do it four times, I stop at output four. You can choose to count or to say start with, if you would start with five, then this one would be five, six, seven, eight. And then you can choose to count or to say start with something and end with something. 
if you start with 37 and then with 84, you might be lazy to do the, the math. Uh, and then you will use the end. A step, if you need output 2, output 4, output 6, you will do a step of 2. All right? Within that placeholder, you can do some math. Here you can do some C sharp uh, style math without intelligence. Um, there is no C sharp project there. It's just a text box, so, but you all know by heart how to make good C sharp. So you can enter it in there. Here just x plus 4. So instead of 1 here, I have a 5. Okay? Then you have a small option. Do you want to override the selection? Well, in this case, I started from here, output 1, and the output 1 is there. I want to override or what? Otherwise, I would have output 1 twice. Okay. That's the repeater tool. A small thing, not crazy. We didn't invent something really crazy there, but uh, it might be quite useful. Uh, that's an example of a protocol. You can use that on any kind of file. It's there available. You can use it on C sharp. You can use it on anything you want. Okay. Next one is a big one. Uh, GIS macro. That's probably something you don't know. Uh, all right. That's a very new one. Uh, what's the point of there? Uh, what's the idea? We've seen that a lot of people made some tools of their own to automate some things. Uh, that are not already part of DIS. If you have a feature that you feel is missing in DIS, what you'll do naturally, you'll make a new solution, you'll make a new project, you'll somehow give it an input by copying to the clipboard or whatever you will do, and then you will tweak your file. Uh, example, you want you have 100 parameters, and you started with ID 10 for a parameter, and you have all of them, and then you're like, oh, I would like to use from 1 to 20 for something else. Well, with this one, you could select all those parameters and say, okay, increment every parameter ID through the whole thing by 100. All right, that's a, a classic example, but basically with a macro, you can do anything. You could do it yourself in the past, but you need to take the time to open a new solution, create a new project, think how am I going to input it, how am I going to output it. Uh, basically, Everyone is reinventing the same wheel every time. All right, so we embedded it for you into DIS. The other big advantage there is that the protocol, as you can imagine, is already parsed by DIS to know to show that DIS tree structure to be able to do the display editor. We parse all that XML into a nice model pro protocol model object. So we made a class for every tag. We made a class for every attribute. All of that we make in DIS to be able to read it and to write it efficiently. Well, all that model is now accessible to you. Everything we use, everything DIS uses behind the scene is accessible to you in those uh, macros. Okay? So, again, available via DIS tool window, and in there we have a new one, DIS macro. And that will open this pane, and then you have First to section, DIS macros, and then my macros. With DIS macros, those are all macros that we give you when you install DIS. It's included in the DIS package. Uh, you're not going to make them. You're, from here, if you right-click, you cannot add a macro. You cannot rename a macro. It's ours. We made them for you. Uh, and in my macro, it will be empty. When you get it, you can make your own macros. All right? You can export them and import them. Uh, to share it with your colleagues or to share it with us. If you make a nice macro, feel free to share it with us. All right? Uh, and then potentially what we can do is tweak it a bit if we think uh, it needs to be tweaked and we can ship it within the eyes. All right? Uh, what else to mention there? That's pretty much it. So that's the list of macros we have currently. Not that many. Uh, we still need to work on them. Uh, but yeah. Ask a question. Yeah. Uh, would you just use whatever language? Like, what do you? It's C sharp. It's C sharp. How do you run the macros? How do you run? It's coming on the next slide. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right. No worries. Uh, so this is just managing macros. So how to make your macros from the my macro? You make folders. You make uh, macros. Small nodes. Uh, it's also a first release MVP. Uh, you're not yet able to move macros. So if you make a macro into a folder, it's there. 
the only way then would be to copy paste it or to uh, export and import or something if you need to move. It's a bit of a pity, but it's not the first priority to be able to rearrange them. So typically you make a macro and then you make five of them and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a folder. No, it's too late for now. All right. How does a macro look? If you make a new macro here from your menu or if you open one of the existing one, if you double click it, it will open the macro so that you can edit it. It won't run it when you double click because this pane was thought as being a DIS macro management uh, tool. All right, so if you double click it, it opens it here and then you can edit it. You can see it's an XML file, a bit like a protocol because we're used to it. We said, okay, let's keep on with the XML. Uh, you give it a description. Well, why is that description uh, useful? Well, if you hover over a macro, then you have the tooltip tip with the nice description of what it does. All right. Uh, I did highlight here this XML namespace. Uh, why is it? Because exactly like from protocol, you have an XML namespace. That is what is used by Visual Studio to assign it to a, a certain XSD schema. And that's what allows all the validation of your XML plus the IntelliSense. So, yeah all the validation of those and all the IntelliSense that makes it very easy is thanks to that namespace. Why did I, do we typically never mention because you don't need to care about that? Here I mention it, why? Because Cube currently removes that. Cube was originally designed to make them the, the, oh no, I'm already next slide, sorry, never mind. Macros, you have the namespace there, all right? Uh, it will be for automation script afterwards that I have that remark. Okay, uh, a bit same as a quick action, you have then the script and in your code there, that will be the C-sharp code. And then you have that button and then you have also a possibility to import some DLLs that are not by default uh, no, into macros. All right, if I go to the next slide, that button, exactly like a quick action, you can click it and then you have a temporary c -sharp project that is created somewhere on your system. Uh, it's gonna be cleaned up, no worries about usage of uh, your disk usage. Uh, it's a temporary project, and then you have all the nice uh, c -sharp features from Visual Studio, all right? All this will be added by default, except the engine dot that I added here, just to show you that you have the nice IntelliSense with documentation, so there is a whole API behind engine uh, it's all documented. I'm not going to go deep into that because there is a lot uh, to say. We could spend two hours, uh, but it's all uh, documented. So you have IntelliSense, you check what you want, and then you have some information. Okay. I would recommend if you make your own macro to take one of the existing one into a DIS, look a bit how it works, and use that as a base on how to get started. Okay. All right, how to run it? You just right click and run, or you select and run. Okay, two options. Uh, do know that depending on the macro, the inputs might be different. For some macros, the input can just be the file. So by default, the input is the last file on which you had uh, focus. So if you're looking at a file and then you open this guy and run, it will be executed on that file. Okay, but you can also select a piece of your file and then run and then into the macro you can define just go through the whole file or go through the selection or do both and in, if there is a selection do something if not do something else for example okay all right that's it for the macro any question it's a big one uh, it's a it's a big feature it allows a lot of things uh, if you really want the DIS feature, and we are being a bit too slow for some reasons, uh, feel free. You have everything we have in there. The protocol model is there. Uh, all the XML is nicely parsed. So if I go uh, back here, if I go engine dot input dot and the input is a protocol, I will have a dot protocol model. Uh, and then from there, it's exactly the XML structure. So if you look for parameter you will go protocol.params.param.name if you want to read. Okay. The something good to mention already, by the way, is that into the input, you will find the protocol model. 
That's what we call the read model. It will only allow you to go through your driver, but not to edit it. To edit it, you have to go through the protocol edit here. They have the same structure, the one of the, of the protocol. Uh, but yeah, for a performance reason, for the design of the IS, we needed to split the read model from the write model. Uh, you can always, from one, find the other. So if you, are, if you did go through your read model and you find a parameter that you want to edit, you can, from there, find the corresponding parameter into your edit model. Okay? All right, that's it for the macros. Next is also the big one. That's the one that is going to be released uh, next month. So, so far, everything is already in your hands. Uh, this one is not yet uh, quite, or actually not that good yet in there. Uh, but now it's going to be uh, available next month. What's the concept? That's an open source API, an open source c -sharp API. Basically, in many of your drivers, there are some methods that you want to redo. And currently, uh, within the driver, you can avoid duplicating the code by doing a pre-compile quick action. But if you have five drivers using the same class, the same namespace, the same library, whatever you want to do, uh, right now you have no nice option. This is where the class library comes in. Uh, the same, you have a base package that we provide that is open source. You have access to the code. You can look how we do the things. Uh, we share it to you fully. Uh, but you cannot touch it. You could. But every time we upload, it will get overwritten. Okay. Same for the, I forgot to mention that, by the way, for the DIS macros, the same here. You can tweak a bit the code to you need. So we don't allow you to add macros in there or to remove them, but you can tweak the content of it to your need a bit. But then every time you update DIS, it's going to be back to what it was. Okay. Uh, if we have time, I'll make a small demo and you'll see why you would need to tweak a bit the code. I'll show an example. All right, so back to the class library. You have the base package. Don't touch it. Uh, but it's fully customizable because you can make extension. You can make as many as you want custom package. You can base them on the base package or you can do whatever you want that has nothing to do with our package. Uh, all of that you can do. Okay, and it's also easily, that was the point, easily to develop, maintain, deploy. Why? Because then the code is in one, one location and you can tell the driver, okay, now I'm going to use that new version of my uh, class library package and it's all going to update magically for you. Okay, uh, you might wonder why not using DLL in any classic uh, c -sharp project or any language project, you would use some DLLs that you share. Uh, in data manager, you can also do that. You add a DLL to the protocol script folder, and then any quick action can use that DLL. Well, we didn't want to go there because, first of all, ease of deployment. Uh, I don't know if you know, but in data manager, if you upload an existing DLL, you need to reboot your data manager for that new DLL because the DLL is cached into the app domain. And once it's in there, it's in there, all right? So wouldn't be convenient for that reason. And also for dependencies. Uh, if you have 10 drivers using that same DLL and you want to update that DLL maybe for five of them, because updating the DLL causes you to have to rewrite a part of the driver, uh, maybe you want to do it for five of them and not the other five. Here you have no possibility to do that with DLLs. Once it's loaded, the namespace it's loaded. Okay. Uh, now here, with the class library, the way we made it, it's all C sharp that is actually added by data miner to your driver. So each, we do have redundancy, but managed. So you don't need to worry about it. You don't have the downside of the redundancy because if you update it, it will update all of your drivers automatically if you need it. You don't need to manually copy paste. All right. Does that pose a downside on the protocols? Sorry? Does that pose a downside on the system without the protocols? No. Uh, a tiny bit. Yeah. One uh, memory disk usage. I mean, you have that text which will be in every driver. Uh, but I think that you can neglect. Uh, if you have a data on a system, it's not that, that's not going to be the bottleneck disk wise. Right? Uh, so, yeah, no. Other than that, uh, just the XML file size. 
but computing wise it's going to be uh, as performing. Cool. Is it the class algorithm connections versus what? What? The class algorithm. Yes. Uh, it's not yet supported, but it has been designed so that the exact same class library, the content of the code will be the, uh, not the same, of course, because you cannot do the same things, but all the methods. Will be we will make the exact same API, the exact same structure, the same classes and namespaces and stuff. It is the but it's not yet in there. For now, just protocol that was the first priority. Uh, but future we would like to have it in automation. It's already designed with that in mind so that we can easily do it. Okay. All right. Uh, how to use it? Again, via DIS. Uh, well, no. Let's first go back. Uh, via the DIS settings, you have now a class library tab that is added here. You can configure which base package, so that's the package we give you together with DIS. Uh, why is this? If we make a breaking change in there, we're not happy with the structure anymore, we make a breaking change, the new version will be in the DIS we ship to you, right? But we don't want to update to that new package your protocol automatically, otherwise it might break your quick actions that are using it, and then every time we update, you have to refix your quick actions. So basically, in here you can configure which one you want to work with. Okay? We'll see on the next slide that if your driver was made on a package that is not the same as here, you will get a pop-up that will tell you, okay, do you want to update or do you want to keep working with the old one? Just if you like to have the most updated version to have all the latest fixes and features you do, but then you know that you might need to update some other parts of your driver. Uh, if you just want to make a small change to it, you don't not gonna bother if my driver is working. I'm not touching that. So sorry, if you're using class R one zero zero X and my first call was one zero zero one. Yeah. Sleep on that as it were. You'll get that pop up. Uh, you will be after you want to update. And it will say, note that if you update, you might need to change some part of your code to be compliant with the new version. And if you say no, it's not going to touch your driver. Okay? Then you have the community package. That's the package that every one of you can make. Again, if you make something that you think is really useful, share it with your colleagues. Share it with us, if you like. Uh, and maybe we'll think it's a great idea and we'll include it in our uh, own package that we make for you. Okay, it's the point here to have some a community package. It tells uh, what it is. It's a community developer. It's all open source. The point is that we grow together and improve it together. All right. And then you have a checkbox, important, automatically generate the class library code. So like I said, we have the class library package that we give. And what it does, it will add into your protocol what you need from that package. And that can be done automatically. So it will detect when you need it. It will add it. If you don't need something, we won't add it into the driver. We'll get to the next slide what I mean by if you need it or not. All right, so you can do it automatically. Every five seconds, basically, it analyzes your code and says, OK, we need to add some part of the class library on that. OK. Or if you don't want that, maybe you have a huge driver and it takes a bit more, too much resources you might want to trigger it manually only, and then you disable it here, and via the DIS code helper generate class library code, you can trigger it whenever you like. Okay. Okay, uh, how to get started with the class library? It's not easy, you don't know the API, uh, you don't know what you can use, you don't know what's in there. Uh, for every new namespace, new big functionality we add into the, last, the class library, we also add a snippet. So if you go to the snippet, DIS, you will have a new folder in there that is class library. And in there, right now, we have two things. We have a get DMS. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with DMS, but from there, you can do get elements, get views, uh, by name, edit element, and all of that. All of that we, what was with some kind of a very low-level calls. Typically, something we don't like to work with uh, as programmers. So here we made it high level. We made some wrappers around with some uh, checks. Is the input you're giving correct? Uh, does it all make sense? And then run it for you with a nice API friendly. OK? So you start from one of the snippets here. Right now, we have get DMS and trap info, the one that used to parse trap. 
don't know if you're familiar with Trust, but it's quite an ugly object there. It's an array containing some arrays, containing some arrays, and then you have to dig in there to find the info you do you want. Well, now with the trap info, it will add this line, my new trap, uh, trap info from trap data. So we're going to parse that trap data. That's the object you get from the run, if you remember. Uh, you get that ugly object here. Well, with that line, it's going to be parsed into a nice trap info object. And then from my trap, you have the OID, you have the different variable bindings, that will be an array. Uh, and then from a binding, you have the value, you have the OID, etc. All the parsing is done for you. Okay. What happens now is as soon as you use something here, it means you're using the trap info class. So that means that trap info class needs to be copied to your driver. Okay. So DIS will see as you type that you use the trap info and it's going to create a quick action. That quick action is going to be 63k DID. Uh, if you have already a quick action 63k uh, created, it will just increment. See if 63n1 is existing or not and keep doing that. And then it will give it a name auto-generated class library and add some content. It's a free compile one, it's an API to give you some uh, info. Of course, this one is auto-generated every five seconds, you don't want to touch that one. Okay. Uh, by the way, it starts with some comments here containing some XML where it defines what is the base package that you've been using and what is the custom packages, what are, because you can have as many as you like. Okay, so this is what is used by DIS to know, okay, that driver was made using that specific class library. Now in your settings, you have a new one. What do you want to do? Do you want to update the driver, but then that full API might update, and then all the quick action that uses it might need to be reviewed? If you say, no, we don't touch this, uh, you keep working the way you were. Okay? Please don't touch the name. That's what we use as an identifier for that quick action. So if you touch the name, we might create a, a second one, and things might go heavy. So okay. If you call different parts of the class library and different queue actions, you only get one free compile queue action from the class library. Yes. Everything you need in it. Yes. And it just happens. But you don't run. I mean, you load. It's a namespace. Oh yeah. Sorry. You load a namespace. That's not. Uh, it's all based on the using, by the way. So if you have a using, and if you use something. C sharp, I'm not, it's nothing to do with data miner anymore here. Uh, the compiler will load what it needs. It doesn't load more, even if you have a using, by the way. If you have a using and you don't do anything with it, it's not going to load it. The compiler is going to get rid of that using. You have it grayed out when you in Visual Studio, when you have a namespace you don't use. It's going to throw that to the garbage, like any comment or like anything you don't need. Okay, so resource wise, you don't have to worry too much. All right, uh, of course. This quick action, the class library is, I hope, getting to get huge. Uh, so we don't want everything in there automatically. So this only contains now a namespace, Skyline Protocol SNMP traps, because I've been using here this guy. Right? And right now, what is it going to contain? Just my trap info object. But not even yet my OID method. It's just the, ob the object. All right? So this one is not just going to create the object, but not yet the method, because you don't use it. Let's not add it. OK. Uh, you don't want to touch the name. By the way, you also don't want to move it somewhere else into your driver. It has to be the very first quick action in your driver. Uh, why is that? It's simple. Uh, you typically make your own pre-compile quick action, which is typically quick action 1 or 0, right? the first one. Well, if, that, if you want to use the class library into that one, you need this one to be on top of it so that data miner goes top to down uh, to compile them. When you have multiple pre-compiled, normally we, we always said one pre-compiled pre -compile But in here we make an exception because there is one you make yourself, there is one we make for you. Okay? So it's important this one is the first if you want to be able to use it in, the, in your pre-compiled pre action. Okay? All clear so far? No. This is going to be very colorful. The macro, the first things we saw, all nice, all user friendly. Uh, the macro and this, it's going to be very powerful if you use it the right way extensively. Uh, it takes a bit, there is a bit of a learning curve 
you. It's completely new, it's not a small thing, uh, but it's worth it. Okay? I've told you, we provide you with a package. You can also make some custom package. So now let's see how to make those custom package. All right. What is uh, a package? It's basically just a zip file. And that zip file should contain all your C sharp files that you want. You can organize them the way you want. You can add folders and all of that. It doesn't matter. We just go through the whole zip file. We find all of the C sharp files here. And then it also needs a manifest.xml. That one needs to be on the root folder of your zip file. Okay. What will be that manifest? It will be the XML file that we have here. Uh, again, it has a namespace just to make it easy for you to have all the IntelliSense and the validation so you don't need to remember by heart how to make such a file. It has first an identity. We give it a name and a version. Seems obvious the reasons. Uh, the version, we follow the same rules as for uh, protocols, four digits. The last number you increment if you don't make any breaking change. Uh, the third number you increment if you make a, a breaking change. Uh, and then the first number is to make completely something completely out of scope. So a different, uh, you completely redesigned basically the thing. Okay. Uh, what else do you have? A minimum required version. We don't do much with that, uh, but it's just for you to add some requirements for being able to use that package. In, in this case, for example, we require data miner 9.0.0. Something, something. Okay. Uh, we don't do anything smart with it. Uh, all we do is uh, showing it here. Into the configure so that the user knows. Okay. Uh, next is dependencies. As I told you, you can make as many as you want. Uh, you can perfectly make one that is a base one for another one. In some cases, I want just a subset of a class library. I'm going to make that one. And in some cases, I want a big extension of it. I'm going to make a dedicated one. But of course, the extension needs the base one. All right? So here you can say, OK, dependency, that's the name of the class library. So here I make my custom package one based on the class library. Class library is the name of the one we ship for you, the DIS one, the sky one. Okay, and then you can optionally say, okay, minimum version is this one, maximum version is this one. Min max are optional. Maybe you just need a package. If there is no breaking change that requires you to update your uh, custom package, you don't need a min max. If we start making breaking change, you're probably going to be uh, likely to need those. Okay, as many dependencies as you as you want. That is it for class libraries. Would you have any additional question? Wonders or complaints? Yes. Where, 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 when you create a class library, where it's, where it's safe? You, you don't, you do whatever you do. Uh, you make a solution in Visual Studio. You create all the C sharp you need. Once that's done, you put every all of those C sharp files into a folder. You add the manifest, you make a zip, you save it wherever, wherever you like, and then into your DIS settings here, you would tell DIS where he can find the zip file. So, so it's the zip file saved locally on your machine? Yes. So if I created one and asked them, for example, wanted to use a class library, yep. where, what would it, how would I share it? Uh, we don't have it here. Uh, you put it on your kit or on your SVN or any of it. Pull it down locally. Yes. And use locally. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. It's just share it with your colleagues. Uh, send an email. Put it on your uh, server. Yes. It on the server. So whatever. With the C sharp, can you have third party DLL? Yep. So it's just literally like a solution. Yep. What kind of solution would it be then? An example. Just a class. Well, yes. Uh, a stupid example, you have a manager and a device uh, driver, to, you make two protocols, and you need them to communicate together. What typically do you do some kind of API, either an XML API and you talk to each other. Well, that API, you could make a C-sharp class to serialize it, your message, and serialize your message. You would have to copy that code into both. So now you make a class library package, that's already something very custom, uh, and you share it within two drivers. Okay. Uh, that's an example specific 
to a device. But another example is okay. Uh, I don't know. You want to to provisioning your system, to provision your system with plenty of elements, starting from a database. Maybe maybe you want to do that via a manager, via different managers. Uh, you'll work on it. Your colleague will work on it. Let's make a custom package. All right. You want to use. A get column. I don't know if you've ever done a get column into data miner. That's like a, what I said uh, uh, during the presentation. It's quite an ugly call to do a get column that we have, right? It's a very low level uh, call, very technical. You don't have nice argument names. You don't even have types, so you pass in a, an object. You might want to make a wrapper to simplify your life. That wrapper, you definitely want to share it with your whole team. Okay? That's different examples, but you can go wild. It's C sharp. You do whatever you want, whatever you like. As soon as you see the need to share it with via different protocols or for your colleagues. Would you possibly then? I mean, say I'm saying you want more of an MVP. Sounds really good. We're just seeing more further down the line. Seems to I guess the bugging where you obviously have a folder of um, all your DLLs and your DMA. Same ideas. Obviously, you can. We can say one folder, let's say it's our own hardware, where we can just find all of the community packages mm -hmm. available, and that would allow us to. Yes. Uh, yeah. Again, that's the MVP right one. Uh, we do have the plan to do that. By the way, we had the plan to do that for many things. Uh, we have snippets. Yeah. You can make your own snippets. Uh, we have some. We have macros now, we saw it. We have class library. Uh, we have a fourth one, which doesn't come to my mind right now. Uh, but all those things we might want to share. And currently, some do by email, but it's, it requires some effort, so it doesn't happen that much. Uh, we have the ambition in the future to create a shared community uh, system, uh, a way to, from the I say, OK, I made something, I want to share it. It would go to some servers. Uh, we would get a notification, we would maybe validate it, and then we would distribute it. So kind of like new bits, so I see there, yeah. Visual Studio, yeah. find it, go yeah. use it. Uh, not yet for now, but uh, we do have that in mind. Yeah. 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 Uh, class library, yes, yeah. uh, that was the question we got there. Sorry. Uh, it's meant to be working, but it's meant, it's designed to be supporting automation script in the future. Okay. It doesn't today. Uh, first priority was protocol, uh, but it is the intention in the future to be able to use the exact same API within automation scripts. If I've got a protocol, you mentioned earlier, you can upgrade the class library on certain yeah. protocols and not others. Yep. How do I uh, find out what version of class library my particular protocol I'm looking at is using? That was in the, the, in the generated quick action. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, that's the wrong way around. Uh, here it is. So the quick action that is generated That's starts with a XML commented part, and it contains what base package and what custom packages you've been using for making that protocol the last time you touched it. All right. If you now update your DIS and the base package will be 1002, you'll have the choice to update your driver, and then here it will say do, and then maybe some of the code will change in there. Maybe some of your quick actions using it will be broken. You will have to review them, but then you'll be up to date. If you say no, you keep using one. Nothing is going to change that, but you don't have the latest features. You still have all the features from that package, so you can still add some code of some classes that are not yet included there. You can still use it fully like there was no update. And is that the one time thing every time you open it? Every time you would open it. Uh, that's something we could easily add if you like. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if it's a good idea. If you like, we could say here, okay, fix through or something like that, and then it will never ask you. But then you will maybe forget and never think about removing it, and while well, you might want to fit. Normally, you want to fit. Yeah, you don't want to break it. You don't want to it's not compatible with it. Yep. <coughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, it depends what kind of why you make a new version. If you need to make something big, you might say, okay, I'm doing a big review anyway, let's update. If you just 
change your name with a B. Is there any way to tell um, what protocols are using that class library? Uh, so backwards. Because say I'm going to update it, I might not know that someone else has used it in three other protocols. So, no. you know, it would be quite useful to know where to get a list of what protocols use the class yeah. library. Possibly. That's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, if such thing would fit into DIS because we would need to look into some database. Every customer might have a different database, a different way to share the drivers, etc. Uh, what we do have internal, we do have a tool that goes to our database and can find some text in there. So we can say, find me all of the spectrum drivers. We can say, find me all of the drivers that use HTTP, uh, etc. So internally, we could easily achieve that by searching for uh, for these tags. So maybe that's uh, something I could recommend you to do uh, at your place as well. But I don't think it fits in the eyes. The eyes doesn't have the knowledge of all, of all the drivers you've been making. All right. Any other questions? Seems interesting. I think it is uh, it is going to be a big uh, a big asset in two DIs. Just in terms of how you use it, like when you upgrade the class library, do you go through protocols and do nothing except change the, the class library to action, or do you just wait until the protocol is next due to be yeah. upgraded and you're just yeah. going to at the same time? Yeah, that's it. If a driver is working, we won't touch it. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we're already running out of time like that, so uh, yeah, no, we won't be looking for more work. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right, next one is automation script. Also been there for a, a few months already, but uh, not everyone is aware of it. We support protocols mainly in 2 DIS, but we also have some basic supports for automation script. Uh, here is the important notice about the XML uh, namespace. Originally, it wasn't the intention to have DIS supporting uh, automation script. We did it via Cube. You all know you can edit your automation script, create them, and uh, do everything you need via cube. Uh, but then we thought, okay, Visual Studio is a nice tool. It has all those intelligence and all those errors, all those debug possibilities that do plenty of things that we won't do into cube. Obviously, that's not the point. Uh, so we thought, okay, let's do like we do for protocol. Uh, let's support it into DIS. All right. So. Behind the scene, an automation script is an XML file, exactly the same as a protocol. So first thing we need, we need a namespace so that we can have all the IntelliSense and validation XML tag and attributes wise. So you need that namespace to be specified at the root uh, tag of your XML to have all those things. Uh, Data miner was designed to make the automation script, not to receive them. So any time you save an automation script in cube, it rewrites it the way he, he likes. All right? uh, the XML is all the same. Right? It will maybe change small things like indentation, things like that. But any tag, any attribute it's not aware of, it's going to get rid of it. So this one is only useful for DIS. It's by no means used by data mining. All right? So if you import it, publish and import, you're going to lose it. So for now, we're going to change that into the software. Uh, but for now, it's going to lose it, so you'll need to re-add it if you want intelligence in the XML. All right. So you have all those tags, uh, and then mainly you have the script, and in the script you have an exe, and then you have value, and into the value you have all your C-sharp codes. All right. That's what we're mainly interested in DIS. Why do you use DIS for automation script? Because of all the capabilities of Visual Studio to deal nicely with C-sharp code. All right. If you need to add some uh, dummy parameters, uh, input parameters, you know, via cube, you can say add an input parameter, and then when the, the script starts, it asks you for some inputs, or it receives it from a correlation or whatever. Uh, all those, I would say, you can add them here via XSD. You have the IntelliSense, you have snippets also. You can add them there. But I still think it's more user friendly to add them via cube. So typically, what I do, I create my script via cube. I add all the dummy parameters I need, all the input parameters, all those things. And then I create a C-sharp thing, and I don't touch it anymore. I import in DIS, 
and then I press that button. Uh, I press that button to have that C sharp project, temporary project created, like we did for macros and like we did for uh, protocol. Okay. So, like I said, uh, we have all the XML, we have uh, IntelliSense, helps you greatly, and we have error validation. So, this is an invalid tag, unknown, so we get an error into the error list of Visual Studio. Okay, and then we have a nice C sharp thing. We press that button. Up, we have a temporary project created by DIS for you, and then you have all the IntelliSense and all the nice Visual Studio features. Okay, so XML support, C sharp support, and then we also have snippets both for XML and for C sharp, like we do for protocol, exactly the same. So, here, what do we have as XML? We have automation copyright, that's just a copyright message uh, that you can add the roots, that's to add the whole thing here for you, uh, some dummy protocol, and mostly an exe, which is the C sharp part. Okay. All right, uh, we also have a publish, very useful. Of course, you don't want to every time have to copy paste the file to data miner. Uh, so you just press one click, you press the publish button, it gets uploaded to your data miner. Okay, uh, one important note, uh, in automation script, there is no notion of versioning like we have for protocol. So it's only the name, at least for now. I don't know what's gonna be the future, but for now, an automation script is a bit less uh, fancy. Typically, we make a, we make one and we use it. Okay. Yeah, just on the publish button, it kind of scares me a bit that button. Okay. Um, I always think maybe it should be linked to the validation. So if you press it, it automatically validates and doesn't publish it. If you've got errors, yep. that would be useful. It could be useful. Uh, it could be an option. It is something we thought of in the past. Uh, yeah, the benefit is uh, if you're publishing and it's, yeah, if it's a new version, you'll be happy to publish it immediately as such. But if it's existing already, you might yep. go a double check because it just to make sure that that is exactly well, what you want to do. I, I don't think you should publish at all if you haven't changed the version because why would you want to publish a change and not change the version? Well, it's it's should incremental rather than because then it's you still... change the version, right? Because then one, you need to publish. one small note about it, uh, by the way, the reason we didn't do it actually, uh, validation. A huge protocol, it takes a bit of time, right? And it's it's even not designed to be fast, it's designed to be safe, right? It's a validation, all right? If you have a Jenkins uh, pipeline, uh, it takes a while, right? To yeah. do everything, all the unit tests and everything. That's not something you want to do every time you publish in data mining. Do note that by publishing here, what you typically do is you publish to your staging DMR. You don't publish, you, you don't do those things on the operational. And you publish to your demo, you do a lot of tests, you don't care that much if it crashes, normally, uh, depending on what you do on, the, on your staging, of course. But that's the point of this publish, it's to do the development phase, not the real deploy. Phase. It's a publish, it's not a deploy, right? So you do that on your staging, you make quick change, you want to quickly test it, you don't want five minutes of validation before you can test it. And then whenever you're happy, you deploy it. And that's different. You're half convinced. I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm not sure. No. I, we could add it, but then we would need to make it optional. But again, because again, internally here, I mean, what I do and what I recommend when you develop a driver is to publish every two minutes. Yeah. You want to see the result. You want to see if what you're doing is is correct before you go too far, and then you have to redo a whole good bunch of things. So I don't want the validation to happen every five minutes. So in, in, I think in, in reality, in, in the way we use it, yeah. um, we have a bunch of different DMSs. So sometimes um, not all protocols on every DMS. So you'll go to one DMS for the protocol yeah. using the DIS, use the DIS. You might forget to repoint your DIS at different DMS and then hit publish and you send that shitty version out to the production system and it wipes out yeah. like a whole bunch of functionality okay. for it is. But that's very good to know because actually we've always designed DIS as a development thing. Nothing to do with deploying. Yeah. But uh, indeed that's what we do internally. We, we deploy via our database, we don't deploy via our own DMRs. But indeed for a customer it's good to have your feedback because we don't always have the point of view of the customer. 
you might use it differently than we do to deploy. So we definitely can consider it. Uh, send a request to your town, I would say. Send an email, propose it, and it will follow the flow. Uh, I'm not going to promise anything regarding priorities and uh, that you'll manage with sales and everything. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a good idea. And then we would probably make it into optional via the DI setting so that people that, that work more like us, like publish is just development needs to be fast, you can disable it and then you could. Well, I, I quite like the idea of publishing. I actually think you should, it, it should be, you shouldn't be able to publish in any other way, actually, no. but you should just have loads of fail safes on it. So, like, it, it, in my experience, what happens, um, like, even your guys who are developing drivers for us, they won't up the version number, and they'll, they'll ship a version to us without updating the version number, they'll, and they'll be changed and have the same version number as a different version of the driver. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's kind of what happens in reality. And yep. we put that on production, and we've got a version on production, a version on stage, and they're both on the very same V number, but they're actually different code. And we get a right mess because of it. Whereas if you had publish, if you force publish through the publish button, so you couldn't copy and paste code into the directly into data miner, which I don't think you should ever really do. And you should never be like modifying code in data miner on the fly. You should always just grab it. Too. Visual Studio, right, and, and have all your validation against it. Mm -hmm. Do you not um, import export from your state into your life? Then? Well, you, you could do that, yeah, that's still there. That's what we do. Yeah, but you can copy and paste it in as well. But yeah, you yeah, can import export. I'm with you, I'm not a fan of copy and paste, but import export is pretty good. It's just the same it's thing, isn't it? Like the More or less. Export's just exporting it. And yeah, copy, know, and paste like copy and paste, isn't it? Copy and paste function. Yeah, which is much more common. Yeah. But, but normally you would deploy anything by like just copying and pasting the code or, you know, are you talking about taking a deploy server, um, no. a, a CI um, no. chain? No. You, you're deploying automatically, aren't you? And you're going through like a test servers and things like that. They're going to run all your unit tests before it deploys and things like that. When you go into production, mm -hmm. you're forced to run it through that yep. system to make it safe. But I think like you, maybe that's what you should be aspiring to here. Yep. You know? Maybe to stop him from being able to edit code yep. by going through the protocols and templates. It's modular. But that, yeah, it's dangerous. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we've had some problems with it um, with people modifying things, not updating versions, just modifying it like in, in, in Data Miner itself on the production system. <laughs> you know, uh, you've got to keep control of what people are doing. So <laughs> if you don't let them, it, then you don't have that problem because it has to go through the publish method. In theory, you've got the benefit of like saying the same versions. Obviously, you validate and compare because you can say, for example, even if it's the same version, it's wildly different. So, I would invite you to talk about that to Tom uh, because I have the feeling we does it fit into the eyes again? It's again another debate because maybe it fits in data miner to check, okay who published it, how did it get published from the UPIs directly, uh, from typing into the code directly, and then do different kind of things based on that. Uh, there could be a lot of discussion to find the best uh, approach to solve your uh, concern there. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's something we could look at. All right. Importing. Uh, we can publish, but we can do the same the other way around. We can import from your data miner any uh, automation. All right. So via DIS DMR, you had import protocol in uh, import automation script. You have the list of automation script. Uh, you can. This is the views. You have also views into the automation script. You can create folders and then. Uh, so these are the the data miner uh, views, the folders and scripts and you can select as many as you want and import and then they will get opened into your DIs. Alright, that's basically it for the new features. Of course we've done a lot more than that, but that's the ones that we considered worth showing today. Uh, all the rest is smaller tweaks, uh, things that are obvious from the UI. Okay, we have something new. Uh, it's obvious how to use, so I don't think I need to present that to you. Uh, yeah, that's the big ones. Uh, maybe a quick side note, yesterday during the presentation, uh, Ben uh, switched a lot of uh, slides uh, because he was running out of time, some of them was DIS. Uh, he was 
I wasn't aware. I just saw it passing by. Uh, so just if you wonder, I did catch one. Maybe there was other things that were going to be uh, mentioned. But uh, one that I catch is the unit testing. That's something many customers have been requesting uh, to have some more validation on protocols. Now we have the validation, which just go through the code. But without, that's just testing the syntax. We don't test the integration. Uh, we don't test any of that. All right. So we do have on the pipeline, not started yet, uh, but it's uh, really high on our list. Uh, right now, when you have a protocol, it's just an XML file. When you click that button to open a C sharp, it goes to a temporary folder. All right. We're going to change that. We want to change that. We want to make a protocol a solution so that it feels a lot more like normal programming where you have a solution, different classes, a file, a class, and things like that. And then you can add some files to do some unit testing and all of that. We want to move to that direction. So if you have a Git or if you have an SVN or if you have any uh, source control uh, application, uh, we won't upload anymore just the XML to it. We would like to upload the solution, which contains all of the C sharp files, which contains the XML, which contains additional unit tests. Uh, that means we've been mocking SL protocol. Uh, this was so far not possible because SL protocol was just a class. Into data miner, we now made an SL protocol, an I SL protocol, so an interface, which is required to have the mocking. Um, th those are details, uh, just in case you want to know uh, what happened behind the scene. Uh, this will now allow, we needed to wait for that to be in the in data miner to be able to implement mocking in DIS. Uh, and then you have all the possibility to do unit testing. All right. Uh, next part, uh, tips and tricks, some hidden features, some things that we've had the feedback, oh, would be nice if you could add this or this. Well, guess what, it's already in there. Uh, we've had that a lot, so I'm going to go through a few of those. Uh, the first one is, it's a time saver. It's one I use 20 times a day. Uh, but apparently, unfortunately, many colleagues or many customers are not aware of it. Uh, what is it? We've seen, you all know that if you click an item on the protocol tree, you get to the XML that corresponds to that item. We have the same the other way around. All right. So if you're lost into your XML, you can find into your DI tree where you are. Uh, a classic use case, uh, you have a method in C-sharp. In this case, a stupid example maybe, but set columns. You're going to control F, search for set columns, and then you find yourself in here. You have no idea what you're looking at. You have no idea. You know it's a quick action, obviously, in C-sharp. But what quick action? You don't know. All right. What you'll have to do is scroll up or scroll down to find the next big action or the beginning of it, but you might, you might spend quite some time scrolling there if the quick action is big. Well, we have a feature that has always been there via control one, a shortcut, but it wasn't visually available, so no one knew about it. So you could do control one, and then it would jump here to the right place. So here, if I control one, which we now made the feature available via that little icon here, so if you press, if you are currently your cursor is here, you press that icon, it will tell you why, where you are. You are currently it's in quick action 4,900, and from there you can click that guy, and then you get to the top, and then you can click that guy, and then you get into your C sharp uh, editing project. Very useful. In many cases, this is the most obvious one with the C sharp. All right. Because if it's a parameter, typically it's not that hard to find the parameter, right? You just call one up or one down, but a quick action, you can get a bit lost. Okay. Uh, note that this button, a very side note, uh, we didn't invent it. It exists in Visual Studio. So into your Visual Studio Explorer, uh, Solution Explorer, you have the same feature. If you have a big solution with many classes, you F12, you go from one class to other, another. Again, you don't know where you are regarding your solution. You have that same button in Visual Studio, sync with current active document, and it jumps into your solution explorer to the file you're currently looking at. Just a side tip. Okay. 
selecting full items from the GIS tree. That's also possible. Here again, a stupid example. It's a small, you could do it yourself. Uh, but if you have a huge quick action, if you have a huge uh, parameter, if you have a tree control, whatever, you can just control click on the item here and you have the full item selected. If you want to quickly comment it out, get rid of it, copy paste it. Nice and easy. Quick, time saving. Same with shift. You can click on parameter 5 here. Shift click on my other. This is the duplicated one I've used for the validator uh, error I showed a bit earlier. So typically I made it just to demonstrate the validator. I click the first one, I shift click that one, they got all selected. I can delete it very quickly. All right. That's a small tips for the GIS tree. Uh, getting on that, I'll talk about the generate write from read, which we also improved and also has some nice features. Uh, I've seen that the generate write for read is accessible via this little guy. All right. So many people have been thinking, maybe because of us, because we made it there, uh, that it applies to one parameter. But you can do it in bulk as well. So via the shift click, you can select many parameters. Via control click on params, you could select your whole list of parameters. And from there, you can generate right parameters. Again, control two, you can put a, a shortcut behind it if you like. And then you get the generate write for read pop up with all of the parameters you selected. That guy is a, just not copy pasted in the parameter to generate. It's a bit smarter than that. It also has some analyzing of the parameters you've been selecting. And it will check, first of all, does it make sense to, to make a right parameter for this guy? If you have a dummy parameter, if you have a uh, track receiver, uh, a tree control parameter, you don't want right parameter for those. So it's going to still be in the list, but the checkbox here is not going to be selected, meaning we're not going to make it by default. You can select it if you think you really want it. Uh, but by default, it's not going to be selected. Uh, here is a, actually another example. This is my read-write parameter. So I just called it read-write so that you know it's already read-write into your protocol. Meaning data manager detected, it's highlighting those in red because it detected those write parameters already exist. So it also unchecked uh, the generation checkbox. All right. Uh, for the next one, those are normal read parameters. They are not SNMP parameters. All right. Meaning for them, you might want to have the setter is true option. Again, by default, setter is true here is selected. And you can unselect or select all via the checkbox on the column. And it will apply to all parameters for which it makes sense. Only for a non-SNMP parameter, you want to do a setter is true. All right? For an SNMP parameter, you never want to do a setter is true. But you probably want to do an SNMP set and get. So all these here are SNMP parameters. DI has detected that, and it's by one click here, you can select all of them if you want to add SNMP set and get. All right. Also quite uh, time saving and useful options. OK. You have all those uh, smart options. You also have some validation and some management of parameter IDs. So basically, typically, it's configured with an offset here. So it takes the read parameter ID and it offsets it with a value to make the right parameter, all right? Typically, 100 is a typical example of what you do. Uh, so you can update that. By default, it will be value 100. You can update and then press update, and it will apply the update to all of them. Uh, the tool will detect if going adding 200 to that guy creates a parameter ID that is already used. Here, you have a red rectangle saying, no, you cannot use that bit. It's already in your driver. All right, so you can search, you can change the offset or search yourself for another bit. Or you have that little icon that appears and that will find for you a next available ID. So from there, it will start incrementing until it finds an ID that is not yet used. All right. It's a useful feature for messy drivers. If you're good organized, normally always keep the same offset, offset leave space for those right parameters. Uh, you should never use it. 
if you're the perfect good. But no one is, uh, so the feature can be handy. Okay? You also have, by the way, a little icon saying something is wrong, and if you hover, it will tell you uh, where to look. If that list would be used with a scrolling bar, maybe you don't see the red uh, border, uh, you have an indication there. Okay, uh, some XML content intelligence. We've seen that we have intelligence, XSD based, uh, that's just XML intelligence by default in Visual Studio. We just had to provide an XSD file, an XSD schema to get there. Uh, but that only concerns the tags and the attributes. Possibly the content, if the content is either value A or value B, we can add some uh, extra validation, but not some dynamic content that depends on everything else in your driver. All right, so in the case you have a timer, and in there you want to add a group, XSD Visual Studio has no idea what groups, what a group is. It doesn't know even where to look. All right. So within DIS, we added some extra intelligence that's not done by your XSD anymore. It's just DIS, uh, some process behind the scene, and it also can provide you a drop down with all the IDs of all the groups that exist. That would make sense. You can call any group into a timer, but for example, into a group, uh, if you pull parameters into a group you don't add a non-SNMP parameter in there. So it will list only the SNMP parameters. OK? Uh, so you have the ID, and then you have the name. And then, in that sense, you can go through it. You can start typing. It will go already to the right position. OK? You have the same for timers, for groups, for triggers content, for command content, for many other places. I just put four on the slides. Uh, and remember, control space is always a shortcut for IntelliSense. Uh, it's the Visual Studio shortcut that we reused. So C sharp, it's that same shortcut. XML, it's that same shortcut. Uh, in this case, it's still the same as well. Okay. Uh, in the table editor, we have bulk editing. Also, not aware. Uh, everyone is aware because it's hidden via a right click menu. Uh, but here, you have all the columns. You can change them one by one. Uh, but you can also select via shift click or control click many columns and right click and then you have RT display disabled for all of them. All right? So that's the top part of the table editor where you see all of the columns of the table. You have the down part where you see only the columns that you display and in there you have some more displaying options. The same applies there. You can select multiple, control click, shift click uh, and then you can apply uh, enable trending for all of them or things like that. Again, a bit smarter. You can select a whole bunch of parameters. If for one of them, trending doesn't make sense, and you say enable, it's going to enable for everyone else, but not for that one. All right? It's not going to insert mistakes for you. OK, that's on column level. You also have it on table level. We added a small RT display here. Do you want that uh, table to be available in SL element? Do you want to potentially display it or be able to access it from other elements or from automation or whatever. Uh, you click here, it will say, OK, some of the RT display are disabled for your columns. If you want a table to be available, you need all of its columns to be available. All right. So it will ask you, do you want to update all of them to also check them? Same if you uncheck. If you don't need the, the, the table, you don't need any column to be available in the SL element process. All right, so it will propose you to update that in one go for everything. We have some column width validation uh, as well in there. So for every column that you display, you have to define a width, the size of the column. All right. Uh, what do we do as a validation? We check that that size is enough to fully display the description. Because it doesn't look nice if you have a table and you cannot read the title of your columns, right? Uh, so that's what it's going to do. It knows uh, what data miner uses it as a font and as a size and as a margin and everything into those columns. It calculates uh, the ideal speed. If you're too low, it's going to say, that's wrong, you need to fix it. Okay? If any column of a table is, has a too low value, you're going to have a warning icon display next to your 
table so that you know you should double check that one if there's something wrong. Uh, and also, it's going to show up here on the top for the list of all tables, just to see if you have many tables. Maybe there is a, an icon here, but you, you miss it because it's out of scope. You need to scroll to get there. Okay. Side note, you also have uh, the row here to fix all. You will fix all column size of every table into your whole drive in one click. All right. Uh, side note, if you make it zero, that's typically a calculation that you want to be available in Cube if you want to debug the driver, but you don't want to display it to your the end user. It's just a calculation. You make it size zero, we don't look at those. If it's zero, it means you intentionally want to hide it. We're not going to ask you to fix all of these. Okay. Something else, you might, want, you might also say something too big, right? But that's not something we want you to fix. Maybe you made it big because you expected a, long, a big content. We don't only base yourself on the column title to define the width. But still, if you want to make it the optimal uh, width, only taking into account the title, you can right click on it and say update to minimum width. OK? Is there any way of um, dynamically adjusting the width of a column at one side? Uh, based on the content, yeah. I mean, no, that doesn't exist. That would be a data mining feature. Um, yeah, you could uh, suggest it, but good luck to get it prioritized. <laughs> uh, what we have, though, in the future uh, in mind for DIS, again, I'm not prom going to promise any dates. Uh, it's on the backlog, so I don't know when it's going to get scheduled. Uh, but what would I want to add is expected content so that you can add into your XML, okay, here I expect such kind of content. And then it would also take that into account into the calculation. Example, now we only do it on the title, but when we have a discrete, we know what are the, the typical values that will be in there. So we could take into account that's something we still need to add. If you have a date time option, we know typically the width of a date time. It is a bit depending on the regional setting, but we can good, give a good estimation there. So all of that we want to add. Uh, but yeah, future improvements. OK. That's pretty much it. Uh, not a huge amount of things. I don't know what time it is. Uh, OK, that's good. Uh, so yeah. All the features, as, as I've been saying, you can define shortcuts for every command that we have in DS. All right. So how do you get there? You go tools into Visual Studio options. In there, you have environment here. And then you go keyboard here. And in there, you have a huge list of commands. Those are not the DS commands. It's the whole Visual Studio. Any extension that you add will be in there. Anything that Visual Studio has is in there. I don't know, you may be familiar with it, but every DIS feature is also in there. If you, this is a, a kind of a filter box. If you type DIS dot, you will find everything that is under the DIS menu. And it is the case for any menu. That's the way uh, Visual Studio organizes all those commands. Anything that is available via menu, you go through the path of that menu. All right? So if you would want to define a shortcut for this guy, the, the, the name of the command would be uh, tools that options. That's something. Okay. So the is dot everything that is available via the DS menu, and then uh, editor context menu dot code window. That's everything that is available via the right click into your XML. Okay. So here we have, for example, uh, the jump to DIS, the import protocol, the uh, import automation, all of those via the menu. Here, for example, the generic write for read parameter that was via right click. It's available here. OK. How does it work? Uh, it shows you the current uh, shortcuts. It's, you can enter here any shortcut that you want to use. All right. When you do that and you click apply, it's not doing anything yet. So now you just say the one you would potentially want to use. And then here, it shows you if that shortcut that you want to use is already used by something else. And then here, you can decide that's something else I don't care. I never use it. Uh, I'm going to assign it anyway. Only when you assign, then it gets assigned, and then you can press OK. There is also a small feature here to say 
I want it global, meaning I want it only to work no matter what, or I only want it to work if I'm currently editing an XML file, a C-sharp file, etc. Uh, 